dear viewers. I'm Jennifer, and I'm thrilled to have you here on the Jenny Media YouTube channel. Today, we have an intriguing video to share that promises to spark some profound thoughts and discussions. Before we dive into the main video, allow me to provide a brief one-minute introduction. In this video, you'll witness a remarkable interview with Colonel Doug McGregor, a retired Army colonel and former advisor to the Secretary of Defense. Colonel McGregor shares an ominous warning regarding Israel's security and the challenges the United States faces in the Middle East. He discusses the lessons learned from past conflicts, the underestimated power of nations, and the critical need to reevaluate our approach to global issues. It's a conversation filled with insights, wisdom, and a unique perspective on our world's most pressing matters. So grab your seats, get ready to be informed and inspired, and let's embark on this enlightening journey together. Without further ado, let's kickstart this video. And remember, your thoughts and comments are highly valued. Let's begin. Meantime, our next guest, Colonel McGregor, issuing this ominous warning. Quote, in Ukraine, Washington underestimated Russian resolve and military power. Washington should not repeat this mistake by underestimating the potential for a regional Muslim alliance that could threaten Israel's existence. The possibility that Israel could end up like Ukraine should not be discounted. Exactly. And so let's welcome back to the program, retired Army Colonel, combat vet, former advisor to SecDef, and now the CEO of a new organization, Our Country, Our Choice, our good friend, Colonel Doug McGregor. Doug, um, haven't seen you in a while. I know you've been throwing out your opinions on social media, and I have appreciated them. I think they have been level-headed, concise, and exactly what we should be doing. So why isn't the Biden regime talking ceasefire like we've been saying for months they should have been doing between Ukraine and Russia? Uh, Dan, I think there's a huge problem inside the Beltway. It's not limited to President Biden. I think it's widespread, and that is too many people in Washington think it's really 1991, and mm. it's not. The armed forces that existed in 1991 really don't exist anymore. We have very little depth. Uh, in baseball terms, we have a weak bench. We can't recruit for the United States Army. Uh, frankly speaking, we're having trouble recruiting for everybody but the Air Force, and everybody else, frankly, is not getting the people that they want. So that's problem number one. We are not what we were militarily in 91. Number two, we're structured in theory to fight one major war and support one lesser contingency. The truth is we're not even structured for one major war. We've dismantled most of our capability to fight over the last 20 years through these pointless wars of occupation that did us no good. So what, what exactly should we be interested in doing? Well, historically, when presidents looked at the region and they looked at the potential for conflict, they were interested in two things. First of all, can we negotiate an end to the ongoing conflict mm -hmm. and still have an Israel that is robust and strong? And if we can't do that, well, then we're in a lot of trouble. Well, guess what? We're in a lot of trouble right now. The Israelis have mobilized a force that's larger than the United States Army, but they're facing a very different set of threats today different technologies, different weapons. The region is not what it was 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. The region is armed to the teeth. And everyone in the region is watching the film footage coming out of Gaza, showing children that have been wounded, children that are being dug out from the rubble, watching the refugee flow. No one in the region is going to sit still and watch the Israelis pulverize Gaza and drive the population out into the desert. Right. It's not going to happen. So if it's not going to happen, we need to step up and stop it because it's our obligation to save Israel from itself. Mm. Right now, they are on the path to suicide in that region. The Turks will come into this war and the Turkish armies are large and powerful. They can field two million men in a month. Whoa. You we're not even talking about Iran. Iran has already stood up militias all over Iraq, Syria, and in southern Lebanon. Those militias are deadly. We're talking about Hezbollah has 100,000 men. Hezbollah has at least 130,000 rockets, of which 40 to 50,000 are very precise and extremely lethal. The damage they can do is damage that will take decades to repair. We don't want it. And what they've all said is if the Israelis 
refrain from invading Gaza, quote unquote, to finish off Hamas, well, then they won't go to a war footing. We don't want a war, and we need to come to terms with the reality. Assigning the Israeli Defense Force the mission of cleaning out Gaza and finding all of the Hamas fighters is mission impossible. Dan, we couldn't do it very well. They can't do it either. It's best to negotiate an end to this thing, solve the problem. Military power is not the answer. Mm. You've been a commander of troops. If Israel was listening to you and Bibi said, Colonel, what should I have them to do? Because we need some sort of retribution for the thousands of Israeli lives lost and 32 Americans killed. What should they do somehow to try and root out Hamas and get them out of there without a full-fledged just demolition of the Strip? Well, they've already killed more than 2,000 uh, Arabs in Gaza. I mean, that's, a, that's probably a modest estimate. They already killed the 1,500 Hamas fighters that found their way into Israel. So the people that perpetrated most of the atrocious crimes that we saw committed in Israel are dead. And then the thousands in, in Hamas and out of Hamas, just citizens in Gaza, have paid a terrible price. The problem is collective punishment. There's no doubt that very, very few Arabs anywhere in the Middle East have nice thoughts about Israel. <laughs> We're not going to yeah. fix that. But collective punishment doesn't work very well. Historically, collective punishment breeds new enemies. Uh -huh. The enemies don't vanish, they get worse. And Hamas is not so much people as it is an idea. And it's an idea that is made much more attractive by the brutality meted out to them in the aftermath of these attacks. It's easy to recruit people when their families are killed, when their homes are destroyed. Recruiting is not That's a problem. A point. Recruiting on the West Bank for more terrorism is not a problem. And getting the rest of the region involved is not a problem. We, we need to remember Egypt and Israel have had good relations. Israel wants nothing to do with a war. But if Gaza is subjected to the kind of punishment that Netanyahu wants to mete out, the, Isra the Egyptians are going to have a tough time staying out of it. And if they get involved in it, you're going to see everybody else pile on. We don't want it. We can't afford it. We're bankrupt. No one wants to admit the truth. We don't have the forces or the means to deal with this. Right. B-52 strikes aren't going to solve this. Our aircraft flying from carriers won't solve this and we don't have the ground troops to put in there. Do we have a 50 or 100,000 crack combat troops that we can ship there right now? The answer is no. So there's got to be another way. Do you think uh, Ukraine is set up to be an Israel 2.0? Well, I don't know. I, I think that Ukraine is set up to die at this point. Let's be frank. Uh, sending weapons and equipment there, it's not going to change anything at this point. We want to set, we just offloaded eight HIMARS vehicles. These are the rocket artillery launchers. We have identified a thousand ATACMs. These are long range army tactical missiles that reach out to 300 kilometers with great accuracy. We're going to give those to the Ukrainians. The Ukrainians will use them. What will it do? Nothing. It's not going to change the outcome. It may make the Ukrainians feel good if they're lucky enough to hit a target that kills some Russians from time to time or destroys some infrastructure. It's not going to change the outcome of the war. In fact, if anything, it could make matters worse for the Ukrainians. The Russians will double down and make life that much worse for them. So Ukraine is finished. It's it's done. Militarily, there's not much it can do. Somebody needs to step up and say enough's enough. We won't do it. No one in Washington is going to stand up and say, you know, we made a terrible mistake. <laughs> you know, we, we were wrong. Russia isn't weak. We always thought in financial terms. We said, well, financial powers equal dollars on a spreadsheet. Not really. Real economic power stems from resources. Cheap oil, gas, minerals, foodstuffs. What has Russia in abundance? All of the above. 
No one thought that through. And no one understood the Russians. The Russians, gosh, are different from us. <laughs> they react differently. They think differently. You would have thought someone with a brain would have sat down and said, this is not going to produce success for the Russians. But we didn't care. Uh, Washington never cares what others think because we see ourselves as the men in the white hats. We have all the answers. And the answer is be like us. Be like us. Join us. It's almost as bad as Genghis Khan who used to say, join us or die. Well, we say, join us or starve. Join us or go broke. Join us or we'll sanction you and we'll make you miserable. I think the world's tired of it. It's over. Yeah, I think the West has this, uh, well, I see this in Sweden, uh, this idea that everybody wants to be like us. And <laughs> the only reason they're not is because they haven't progressed that uh -huh. far yet. But they're striving to be like us and have our, our uh, decadent values. And, uh, and I think it's the same in the U.S. I've lived in the U.S. and I've seen the same sort of mentality. Um, uh, do you think this could also mean the end of NATO? I mean, think of, I'm thinking of all the new uh, tension with Turkey, for example. Turkey is still blocking Sweden's uh, entry into NATO, and uh, the Hungarians are on the same side as well. But, I mean, with the Israel thing now and Sweden going always following the U.S., supporting Israel, and the Turks maybe supporting the other side i mean uh, does this does this work in a military alliance like that in january of 2022 i was interviewed by dmitry Sons. Uh, he's a well-known uh, russian historian thinker political scientist he's retired now not far from where i live and he asked me about this question of nato and i said uh, NATO will not survive this crisis. And I stick by that. I never thought it would. First of all, NATO was never designed to wage offensive warfare. It wasn't. It was always designed to defend Western civilization, Western Europe. Suddenly, we expanded it and kept expanding it with the goal of trying to turn Russia, ultimately, into a facsimile of what you just described, Sweden or something else without regard to what Russian interests are, Russian history, culture, civilization. It's all failed. And the failure in Ukraine is going to have a profound impact on the rest of the alliance. Members of the alliance are privately realizing that they exist to do whatever we want them to do. Well, that's not what the alliance was about. Remember that Eisenhower was very reluctant to become part of NATO. He didn't want it. And he said, if NATO still exists in 10 years, this is when it was founded, uh, that would have put them in the early 60s, uh, then we failed. The whole idea is bad. It failed because we have not found a better way forward with the Soviet Union. Now, that was 1955, 56, Eisenhower. Here we sit and this thing has endured. It's endured largely after 1992 because we wanted it to. And we convinced our European allies that they needed it. And they tended to agree because they saw some benefit to being part of NATO. They said, well, you know, we have a, another channel to Washington, D.C. There's a way for us to extract goodness and benefits. After all, the Americans will come here and defend us. And we don't have to spend as much on defense. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll, we can also work trade deals and other things because of our cooperation through NATO. Well, that has, that's gone by the wayside. Who wants to be part of an alliance that drags you into a war with a country that is not your enemy in, in behalf of another country that is irrelevant to you that's not even in your alliance? I mean, that's effectively what's happened. It's not because anybody loves or hates Ukrainians or loves or hates Russians. These are just facts. So I think the Swedes ought to send off a thank you note to Mr. Orban in Hungary and even send a thank you note of sorts to Mr. Erdogan with the PS, how would you like all of our Muslims? Yeah, I thank him every day. 
I mean, but Swedish politicians are, of course, uh, as stupid as the rest of them. Um, <laughs> and, and they're always late to the game. So they want to desperately join this alliance, uh, just like they want to join the Euro, which, which is also a, a dying project. Uh, what kind of what would a NATO membership even look like for Sweden? Do you think? Would it be more than a yes? Well, you have American you, nuclear weapons uh, pointed. Well, at you, well, well, obviously, obviously, everybody immediately says, "Well, then you are part of the nuclear umbrella." But I have not been convinced for many decades that the United States would risk nuclear confrontation with a, a major nuclear power over a village somewhere in Poland or a small town in Germany, or France, or anywhere else. I just don't see it. Now, there's another portion of this, though, that is very dangerous. You know, the Finns, whom I always viewed as uh, at least rational in the sense that they understood the value of neutrality, and they'd managed to avoid all these wars since uh, the Second World War, uh, would never have even thought seriously about joining NATO. But now they've not only joined NATO, but they seem to be receptive to the idea that the U.S. military will establish a base in northern Finland within short range or striking distance of Murmansk, our, you know, Archangel. What a disaster. I mean, why, why would you do that? I keep asking them all the time, are there Russian forces massing on your border? Did you capture plans from the Russian general staff in Moscow indicating an imminent plan to overrun Finland? I mean, after all, the, the war with Finland went so well the last time, why wouldn't the Russians want to repeat that experience? You know, it's just stupid. It's back to this question of why would the Russians want to rule Lithuanians, Latvians, Estonians, Finns, Swedes, anybody? Forget it. It's a lot of trouble. You know, the Warsaw Pact became as much of a vanity project over time as NATO has been a vanity project for Washington. I mean, let's face it, you know, by the time the British left India in 1947, India was a vanity project for the British Empire. They were no longer extracting the, the huge benefits from their colony that they once had. That's one of the reasons they left, you know. Of course, their debt-to-GDP ratio in 1947, thanks to us, was 240%. Well, our debt-to-GDP ratio is up over 120 125%. People say... Well, that's not very much. Yeah, but there's a difference. We're talking about a $33 trillion sovereign national debt. And if I went into the details about privately held debt and foreign held debt and so forth, suddenly it would dawn on everyone, this is a catastrophe. So we're in a very different position. Everybody says, well, you know, we've been down this road. We had problems in 2008. We had problems in 1994. Ladies and gentlemen, the United States is no longer the nation it was then. And the level of indebtedness is astronomical. We didn't face this in the past. So I think anyone who thinks they're going to benefit enormously or strategically from joining NATO at this stage who lives in Europe probably ought to seek therapy. Can't you see Turkey coming to the rescue of Sweden when Russia attacks? Oh, <laughs> I think once they realize that they can go up there and do what their uh, you know, co-religionists are doing, especially with all the lovely and attractive people in Sweden, I'm sure they'd be delighted. But uh, no, you're right. It's absurd. And the Turks know that privately. They, they are a paper-only member. Their, their views, their agenda is 180 degrees out from us. The only thing that we should be interested in as Americans, frankly, to the extent that we can have them, is good relations with the Turks, simply because they are the 800-pound gorilla in the Middle East. Now, that may or may not always be possible, but we should seek that. But the notion of making them an ally and expecting them to come to our aid, I mean, you know, this is something President Trump said when he was in Japan. He said, this is a wonderful country. He says, I'm so impressed with it. Uh, why are we defending Japan? Japan can defend itself. And oh, by the way, there's no agreement on the part of the Japanese to come to our aid in the event that we are attacked. It's a one-way street. So, you know, Americans are waking up slowly to these realities, but I think when the financial system implodes, they'll get a, an ugly education. In the meantime, I, I think that the Swedish government ought to have a referendum. Yeah. Put it to a vote. Yeah, yeah but they're kind of 
we veered away from those democratic ideas that people should have a say in things. So uh, it's kind of yeah, they might they might not go along. Yeah, that's the risk. <laughs> yeah, another problem with NATO and lines like that is it's it's a in economic terms it's a it's a tragedy of the commons. People think that everybody else would come to their aid, everybody else would pay for their defense, uh, the U.S. would pay everybody else. So you know why bother? Everybody would help everybody else, but then nobody has anything. Well, what I tell my German friends is that the solution for Germany is to be German. Stop trying to be some sort of Euro nation that exists to, uh, you know, do penance in perpetuity for its role in the Second World War. Oh, by the way, Adolf Hitler could never have done anything without Joseph Stalin. But no one ever brings that up. Now, the Russians aren't going to apologize for Stalin. I think it's time for the Germans to stop apologizing and just be Germans. You know, Germany is a perfectly reasonable, rational, logical country. It had 12 years, roughly, you know, with a maniac in charge. We all know that. That's unfortunate. It's over. Uh, go back before that, and Germany was a very wonderful country. It's a wonderful country now, but they've got to think about their own interests. I would tell the Swedes to do the same thing. And just because you're a nationalist doesn't put you in opposition to someone else outside your country. That's nonsense. It just means that you identify core national interests that are uppermost in the minds of Swedes or Germans or Frenchmen. By all means, do that. Then decide how far you want to go, just how far you're willing to mortgage your security to someone else. And I think if they do that, you'll end up with a better solution than this thing called NATO because NATO's outlived its utility. Yeah. Um, You know what the solution is to the national debt? Just write it off. And the government will never be able to borrow a dollar for generations again. Mm, I don't know. I think what, what you could have, though, is that you could have an international debt summit. And the people, of course, standing in the way are all bankers. Yeah. Because they they will they will not profit. <laughs> that's right. So, so I think that's that's something worth doing. I, I you know I think that a lot of that can be done, but at the same time you don't want to write it all off because we need to restore fiscal discipline to our countries. You know we've spent ridiculously profligate. Uh, you know our our thinking has been foolish. So we need to we need to develop the discipline we once had. And I think we can do that. So you don't want to erase the entire debt because that'll force you down a better road. Uh, That's my view. And uh, eventually you can get going again. You know, the Germans renounced the debt uh, in 1932 and 33 that they owed to other people. They said, that's it. It's gone. And, uh, you know, if, if they hadn't foolishly gone to war, they were on the verge of an enormous age of prosperity. Yeah. And it's unfortunate. And and this is true for us. It's true for everybody. You know, war is overrated as a business proposition. I wish people would wake up and understand that. There are a lot of sunken costs and all that military equipment. I mean, what? how do you profit from it? You want to resell it? Maybe you'll resell some of it, but you're not going to get much return on your investment. So you only want to build what you really need. Yeah. I mean, Adam Smith in the 1700s, whatever, realized that everybody can ben- everybody can benefit in a business but in war it's only one side if even one side um just one final question and before i just want to read your quote uh it goes like this for we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places and that's paul in the bible um and i believe this is a spiritual thing that's going on and i you started an, an initi- initiative called uh, uh, our country our choice or is it your choice no our choice our choice would you just say just tell us a little bit about that well this i will call it for for short purposes ococ our country our choice we call it ococ it was founded by a group of people who decided and i was not one of the founders uh, I was I was asked to come on board by some very smart people, and and try to make this uh, a nationwide movement. And that's what we're working on. But we said three things. First of all, 
we're tired of all this Republican Democrat nonsense because the truth is it doesn't matter who you vote for, you get the same damn policies. So we have in Washington this thing we call the Uniparty. The Uniparty is owned by various lobbies. Some of those are corporate, some of them are foreign. Some of them are, uh, you know, pharmaceuticals, uh, you know, different kinds of things that for different reasons have, have found a way to essentially buy up politicians. We know that. That has to go away. Uh, I think it will as a result of where we're headed financially. We also said we've got to return to a very simple formulation, you know, faith, family, country. Faith, family, country. One of the things that we've seen with this government that we have is a systematic attempt to destroy the family. Uh, it's incomprehensible to us that now we want the state to determine you know, what, what children learn to believe is real or unreal, that the state uh, controls not only, uh, you know, our lives as, as adults, but is going to enable children without consulting their parents at the age of seven to engage in self-mutilation and transform themselves, they think, from, you know, a boy into a girl. We think that people that are willing to do that sort of thing to anybody who's under the age of 18 should be treated as criminals and go to jail. Uh, you know, so when you look at when you look at the things that concern us, we want to end these pointless wars overseas, stop the interventions. Uh, secondly, we we want to restore the rule of law. You know, we can't go f forward. You know, indulging criminals as as you know from your own experience in your own country, you do it. We've got to stop it. <clears throat> you know, Mao had a had a saying: "Shoot one, educate a million. You know, when you watch people loot and commit crimes against fellow citizens, you shoot one. And you'd be surprised how much attention that gets on the street. Everybody else suddenly says, oh, my God, I better stop her. I'm going to be shot. But we seem to have lost our, our intestinal fortitude, our guts, our courage to do what is necessary to protect our society. So we've got to restore the law of law. And in connection with that, we've got to close our borders. We've got to round up all these people who've come here illegally and expel them. We can't afford them. We can't employ them. They're not coming with skills that will enable them to assimilate. You know, we've long since breached the limits of assimilation as it is, but we'll go under completely if we don't stop what's happening now. So these things have to happen. And then we absolutely must halt the sexualization of our children. Teaching sex classes to third graders? Good Lord, I don't remember anything remotely sexual about being in third grade. What are we doing to ourselves? So, you know, the now you're talking about an appeal across party lines. We're saying, look, there are lots of good people, Democrats and Republicans, who can agree on those things. We need to come together, and we need to go after these people in Washington, push them out of office. We need to force this agenda that I just described to you on to Washington, get out of this terrible pit of despair that we're currently wandering around in. I mean, does that explain it? That explains it. Yeah, you're talking to a country where homeschooling is criminalized and uh, where we have a core cur curriculum for the entire country, which includes sex in every subject. So, uh, yeah, we know what you're talking about. Um, yeah, well, there's a, there is a movement afoot in some European countries. I won't mention them, but they're further south from you. Uh, who are very interested in in basically uh, our our continent, our choice. Yeah, yeah, I know some of them. So. And I think that's damn good, yeah. and that makes sense. That's a European project I could support. <laughs> so uh, I, I hope that you, we will see chapters emerge elsewhere. 